Okay, so looks like Amishi raised the energy level here. So I would like us to continue in the same fashion. Um, let's see, this, is, this track is about changing culture and I'm just curious to see who here uh, is in, uh, in a role in their organizations or, or communities that uh, is leading currently a culture change program or is managing it or um, uh, is advocating for it. So please raise your hands and, sh and shake your hands. And please continue to shake your hands. So now I want to uh, ask to other to join us, those who are affected with the change. Continue to shake your hands, please. Okay, and is there anybody here who is by mistake in this session who wanted to go somewhere else? Okay, I think I th <laughs> all hands should be up by now and maybe someone who just recently retired and it wants to make good friends. Okay, so uh, let's pause for a moment and bring our hands down and just give ourselves a second to feel pulsation of blood on our fingertips and feel a beautiful sensation to be alive. So uh, for, for those who, I, I, uh, I'm not a mindfulness expert, I lead the innovation program in a large chemical corporation. So my perspective will be slightly different. So what's the role of mindfulness and being present for innovation? Uh, but uh, in my spare time, when I get a moment, I, uh, I love Reiki. I'm not a typical uh, insight meditation practitioner, but I practice energy meditation. So this is a little bit of uh, exercise from our uh, energy meditation practice. So, so why companies really care about change and, and culture and all the things and, and meditation and mindfulness? We uh, really, what we care about is really growth. And if you see, there is a lot of pressure to grow. 80% of, uh, of, uh, actually 80% of the factors that uh, we, uh, that companies actually stop to grow is internal, it's not external. We may think it's the uh, really marketplace can change, but it's really about being able to adapt. So the, I'm just gonna read some factors that are internal factors. It's usually, what I say, we stay too long on a premium position activity, so that contributes about 23% to why, uh, why we don't continue to grow. Uh, innovation management breakdown, 17%. Premature core abandonment means if we have a type of product that we are successful and then we actually leave marketplace early, that can actually contribute to another 10%. And then talent bench, bench shortfall about 9%. So all of these factors actually are internal. It are, they are within the control of the management. Uh, and then another reason why companies care uh, is uh, we talk about workforce engagement and the Gallup study has shown that 70% of employees are either not engaged or they're actively disengaged. When you think about potential of, of any, organ I mean, and this is for organizations, I think it varies from country to country and from organization to organization and then also, uh, I don't know what's the statistic for government and, and NGOs, but it's actually very disappointing to, under, to learn and to kind of think about like how much human potential, this unique, beautiful ability that we have that we actually don't utilize. And we th when we think about engagement, really it's uh, diversity. So different people take a different approach to engagement. Uh, so we need to, and, and diversity, we often talk about like mainly about DNA diversity. We happen to be from different, <laughs> different DNA makeup and, and different cultures and the heritage we come up with. But it's all the other things. It's about cognitive diver diversity. It's about the learning preferences and styles. It's how we like to contribute. Values, uh, purpose, uh, styles, I think. So when you think about how do you engage an organization, how do you start engaging maybe just your small team and then how do you propagate through a large organization and, and then create a movement. It's really hard. So it is not a surprise that companies are successful. Usually you see a decade or two, three decades of steady sustainable growth, but then what? What happens is that there is this 
kind of hip, hiccup on the road and, and we can blame it to many factors. We can say, okay, leadership didn't provide the right vision or uh, uh, market has changed and so on. It's really the, the nature of the system itself is such it's very complicated and complex. And therefore, uh, when you think about sustaining growth, I mean, I'm coming from a company that is 150 years old. So sustaining growth decade after decade after decade is a different type of problem than when you deal with sustaining growth in a startup or a company that is only 20, 30 years old or an agency or, or whatever it is. So this is just to kind of give you a context where I come from. Another thing, uh, so for those who haven't heard about VSF, um, we are not a household name, so that's not a surprise. Maybe you remember magnetic tapes, audio tapes, maybe you remember CDs. But uh, BSF is actually the largest chemical company in the world and it supplies materials and chemistry solutions to pretty much every industry you can possibly imagine, from aerospace to agriculture, from coatings to cosmetics, personal care products. Uh, wherever, we are pretty, food, I think I mentioned. so. Every possible imaginable industry, you will probably find our products there. Now, it's 150 years old, and it actually was built on the principle of sustain sustainability. And the company itself went through probably six different stages of the evolution, right? It started with uh, dyes and colors, then uh, agriculture, and then eventually, now we're really looking how to move to, from molecules to system solutions. What's interesting, I mean, what you're seeing here, I would like you to take a moment and imagine that you are, uh, this is our headquarters in Ludwigshafen. Imagine the size of Manhattan, but it's all chemical plants and all connected with pipes, one unit to another unit. And uh, one time when I was visiting my, my first time, I had no clue actually what meant. So I had, I had a meeting in one building and my next meeting was gonna be in a building nearby, at, le at least that's how it looked like on the map. And so I thought I'm gonna walk. So <laughs> I started and I walked and I walked for about 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> I was nearly close where I was supposed to be. <laughs> then eventually a truck picked me up <laughs> and uh, they have these drivers actually, the, the shuffle people inside. And um, uh, 15 minutes later <laughs> in the truck, <laughs> I finally made it to the destination. And that was just a small portion on the map. So this is the space where we, uh, I mean, this is the complexity of the system. I said it's built on, on sustainability principles. So the founder of the company, Mr. Engelhorn, he was 44 when he started the company. So if anybody thinks that it's too late to start their business, uh, you're wrong. Uh, this is a great le I mean, legacy that I think that, that he left behind. Uh, so, what he was, what he actually, why is this sustain, based on sustainability? He used to make, uh, he used to own coal and, uh, and gas company, and there was a coal tar that was a side product uh, of the process. At the same time, a university a researcher discovered a way how to convert it into a dye, indigo dye. And that was the beginning of him thinking how to incorporate more like whatever is the side product or the byproduct of one process to become useful uh, for something else. And then the whole company, the whole infrastructure, everything continued to be built on the same premises, what we, he calls for bond, like highly optimized system. So this is the context. Um, what the challenge is when you're thinking about growth, you actually can go through two ways. One is to acquire other company and there is a limited way how you can go and grow by mergers and acquisitions. The other way is by uh, organic growth. But to have organic growth, you need to have a strong innovation. BSF loves science and technology and we invest in R&D, but it's a long-term growth, right? And then if you think about like, if we talk about engagement and, and using our potential to the, in the best way, we want every employee to be able to be innovative and to continue to drive innovation. And that's the actually our way to think about organic growth. But to do so, we need to create space for innovation and growth in a company like this, in a highly optimized integrated system. So every five years, we come up with a 10-year ten uh, ten strategic vision. And when I joined BASF, it was 2011, uh, BASF was just rolling out its 2020 strategy. And that strategy was uh, 
called time. It's time to move BASF. So T stands for talent, I for innovation, M for markets and customers, and E for uh, operational excellence. So when this strategy was, I'm gonna move a little bit. When this strategy was rolled out, uh, well, one of the strategic, I mean, the, I, I, I mean, there are different VPs that were in, in charge of different pillars of this strategy. It's important that they're all connected, right? Uh, but for innovation specifically, we, uh, we had a vision, but it was really a vision that was not planned, specific plan, but we thought about like potential milestones. The vision was that every employee is innovator, that employees connect and collaborate internally and externally to accelerate our learning and uh, capitalize on the BSF knowledge, and that BSF is a recognized innovation partner for uh, our customers and suppliers and outside partners. So this was the vision and, and I started in a role of open innovation, which means that I, I was supposed to bring our university partners, our small, medium-sized companies and other industries we team up with to uh, continue to build innovation pipeline. Uh, as we were in the process of kind of trying to understand what we do and how, you know, what are the resources and put the systems for management of portfolio and so on, there was a, actually a hard moment in, in this point and I realized that our barrier for growth was much more like on the inside rather than outside. Companies, of course, were interested to partner with a large partner and to tap into broader markets, but we, 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 whether we were ready or not, that was a, a different question. And that question was really more about like how we were wired internally and where uh, at that point I was, uh, you know, I was leading it from North America in actually one, one kind of information. In North America, we said we have 50% of employees less than five years of the company. Uh, they joined either through acquisitions or they were recently hired. And another challenge is that we were all uh, across the region. So being able to connect and actually know the inner work and kind of work efficiently together was not a trivial task. So uh, in order to build, so we realized before going outside and actually being a best partner of choice you can be to your external partners, we actually have to go a little bit step back and look inside and do some internal capability uh, development. And for any change to happen in a large organization in, in a complex system like this one, it had to be really a system, you have to tackle things from a multiple points. Uh, Multi-prong approach was necessary in our case. I don't, I don't know like if each organization will have their own, like we heard the story from uh, Julia today, uh, how Mandela's did it, it's more, more like intervention. In our case, we really had to look at it like more as a, what are the different components of the system of innovation capability that we need to build and integrate and continue to, to develop uh, and propagate through the organization so that all together we can make a difference. Otherwise, it's just gonna be another program or another initiative in a big, huge system and it's gonna get lost. So I'm gonna focus only on three uh, middle parts here. Uh, so culture and climate ecosystem and uh, skills and competencies. And I'm gonna start with skill, uh, skills and competencies first. So um, innovation, many things, uh, or, or in skills, or innovation often was thought it's a talent. You have to be born as innovator, like, or creative or whatever. It, and then, you know, somehow we go and we invent things, right? But there is a system and there is a process and it can be taught. Uh, we started by looking like what are the different things we had inside in-house, uh, different training programs for skills development, but we also looked outside and we looked like what are the best companies, in, best in class companies, what that grow organically and we looked specifically what are the large uh, and older companies that grow organically and systematically decade after decade and what do they do about innovation, what kind of systems do they have. So from the looking from outside and then look, uh, we kind of narrowed it down, filtered it, we then reached out to our colleagues internally and looked like what makes sense and what resonates with the organization. And after filtering and kind of analysis and gap analysis, we kind of narrowed it down to the core topics where we thought we could do something where we have a gap where we need improvement. Based on that, uh, uh, in, again, that happened through different, uh, uh, we, we said we're gonna create a training and it was pretty much a grassroots effort at that time. Uh, so the grassroots effort 
help us to prioritize the topics and especially go where the biggest pain inside of or, or perceived pain uh, was inside of organization. Uh, we implemented 10, 20, 70 learning principle means that when we are gonna deploy these uh, learning programs, we're gonna focus 10% learning from classroom, 20% learning from each other of mentoring and coaching programs, and then 70% should be learning through experience. Um, and then uh, we also decided to do regional pilots and then if it works out, well, we had planned to do global scale up, but we didn't know really how it's gonna go because we are not in a headquarter uh, region, so we decided we'll see, uh, we'll decide later, but we'll have this scale up in mind when we, whatever we build something new. What was actually serendipity, and someone said, if you think you can make a plan, uh, one thing is for sure, whatever happens is gonna be different from what you planned. So um, in our case, similarly, we were lucky that at the same time, Global Talent Strategy decided to roll out new competency plan. And so they rolled out eight competencies and driving innovation was one of these competencies. So they pretty much declared, if you want to be drive innovation at VSF, there are the certain behaviors, how you should behave and, and act. At the same time, if you want to demonstrate leadership in this competency, these are the sets of behaviors and, uh, uh, for leading innovation. Uh, that was nice, but there was really no recipe. Okay, so if you give something like that to like, that wouldn't make sense for an employee like because it doesn't really show how I can develop my competency. So it was just a perfect timing. We decided to take opportunity to connect our training or gap analysis and vision and what needs to be done to, to build capability and combine it with these competencies and then uh, hopefully build a system, learning system and programs that would actually um, uh, integrate these uh, efforts. And what I'm showing there it's more like a framework uh, for our for us what driving innovation competency looks at uh, or feels like at VSF, and I can maybe just uh, we had some existing programs that are more on the process side because we are very good in <laughs> coming up with the processes and the phase gate and other systems right like uh, any other company would have, uh, but where the biggest gap was from these surveys was that it's really about creativity and about solving problems together as teams. So that was our top priority and I'll go, I'm, I think we piloted and tested and developed about six additional programs but I'm just gonna focus on these couple, uh, couple of these programs that are uh, related and directly uh, taking advantage of mindfulness. So one program that we, again, we piloted it twice. First time when we did it, it was much more let's say focus on tools and techniques. There are many creativity management facilitation tools and, uh, out there and techniques. So we redesigned the program and then we uh, actually incorpor or incorporated much more of the mindset and behavior uh, element of the program. So um, it's just maybe, th uh, this program is a two and a half day program and it builds foundation of how to contribute in a creative way and, and solve problems creatively. Uh, we take teams and individual, so individuals and then we had nine sessions last year created. Uh, program had a, such a great word of mouth recommendation so there were, all the programs were filled and we had a two additional intact requests for the teams to go through so if someone would experience it they would actually want their whole team to go because when they go back the language was changed. A lot of language was all about deferring judgment, uh, being able to separate conversion thinking from uh, divergent thinking and so on. Nice thing about program is I actually have it here. If you look at just some of the stages, uh, there is a stage called search. So the search is really about insights. It's about quieting in, uh, your mind and kind of thinking and, and sensing what, what are the opportunities, what is to understand the situation, create a meaning and so on. Because we found that we are really good in solving problems if someone defines problem for us, but searching for what's the right problem to solve, that's actually another muscle we had to build. Uh, and um, so I, I won't go into the details, but basically this, is ba uh, this was grounded on the theory of how people learn and how they uh, apply their knowledge. And so we have different preferences, so to speak. Uh, some like to learn by doing, some like to learn by thinking, some like to apply knowledge to generate more options, and some like to apply knowledge to analyze and make choices. 
like it goes back to are we using executive network <laughs> or we are more into meaning making type of default network. Um, and when people recognize that they have a default preferred way of thinking, then they start, uh, we, we help them learn to accept different other styles and preferences and align everybody like it doesn't really matter what's your preference, it's really if you can manage where are we in the process of discovery from insight to invoice, what we call end-to-end -end innovation. Uh, do we need to do further exploration and searching and do we need to think conver convergent about it or maybe divergent? And it's actually helping teams to be aligned, to be at the right moment, at the right place in the creative process to work together and synergize there and align their energies and thinking um, or, or being uh, to tackle the task at hand. So that's how we applied it uh, in innovation space and then this more talks about statistics and, uh, and applications, so where we applied it. One nice thing that actually, again, it's a nice referral, we uh, figured out that there was a great appetite of organization, organizations, so we then developed Teach the Trainer, actually not really Teach the Trainer, we developed advanced program which talks about facilitation so people who feel really excited about the program they were given a chance to develop skills so they can facilitate process in their teams and uh, now we have something called journey to innovate uh, to uh, facilitation mastery where we have also accreditation program and then uh, you know they're collecting different kind of facilitation uh, facilitating different sessions and deploying it to organization what is nice that was directly applicable to uh, affecting the business. So anything we would bring in these workshops uh, had, uh, I mean, there, was, there were real problems we were working on. So in the beginning, it was more like internal innovation challenges. Sometimes some teams actually will work on their innovation strategy. Other teams were working on um, specific technical problems. But recently we opened it to customers. And so now we have uh, innovation sessions uh, facilitated innovation sessions with the customers. That's the best referral you can get. So my tip for scaling up these programs is really when your customer is excited about what you bring and they want to implement it and use it in their uh, organizations, that's the best referral you can get if you need to convince anybody in your organization that uh, yes, this makes sense. And we can actually look at actual projects that are coming from these workshops that, um, that company uh, uh, can do like a more, create more business. These are just some statistics only. So we focused like when we launched it, uh, full launch like 2014. We had pilots in 2013. 2014 was actually uh, deployment in North America. In 2015, we had uh, increased uh, number of uh, workshops. This is just the North America numbers, but uh, altogether we are we're looking for North America, which has 17,000 people overall company of over 100,000. So we're looking to to reach 10%, which we think it's when you create the paradigm shift, uh, and then um, kind of continuing that that in North America. But what's nice now, this program is actually part of the, uh, it's scaling and going to Europe and in Asia, so it's now becoming global, and, and uh, this overall experience helped us create Innovation Academy under our CTO now, uh, and it's continuing to build towards uh, developing our innovation capabilities. Now this is more when you talk about people, but uh, I wanted to say how beyond capability, we actually took another chance to unleash innovation and connect what we said the external part, the open innovation with uh, internal capability development. Uh, this I never imagined or envisioned that that will actually end up the way it, it did. Uh, last year was 150 years of ESF and we were sort of lucky, the serendipity play, <laughs> plays a role in, in your good intentions, if you have your good intentions and uh, allow some room for serendipity. We had a colleague from Germany to come and visit and spend five months in our group here in North America and when she went back she was reassigned from innovation team to communication team and communication team was given a task to uh, create this celebration program for 150 years of ASF. That was wonderful because what she did, she told them about why don't we make it really co-creation and open innovation and when we are gonna spend money on part B and doing what we're gonna be doing, why not make it really like a global co-creation program? 
And to my surprise and everybody's surprise, <laughs> uh, the team was open to it and the executives were open to it. So our 150th anniversary became a massive global one year long lab of experimentation with creativity and co-creation. So this is where actually we can engage uh, a much bigger work, kind of pretty much all organization, not just all organization, but now it was public. So all uh, our external partners, suppliers, customers, um, non uh, NGOs, uh, universities, and so on. It was one big and interesting party. This is just to give you a scope uh, and of the size and the uh, kind of sense of uh, scope and size. This wouldn't happen uh, just, I, I think, I mean, if you launch something like this global and massive, you have to have a lot of people who will be there to support it wherever, uh, whatever the activities are. We had over 30, 50 different pilots working on pretty much, I don't know how many different formats and different types of tools and methods for co-creation from science symposia, design atons, jamming, idea pitch, we had like a shark tank things as well. Um, idea contest, customer co-creation, uh, and empathic design uh, events, an art project, uh, community service. So this all was happening. We had to train actually support staff and, and not support facilitators across the globe in different cultures that will that will make this thing run. So we had over I don't know how many webinars and. Um, and uh, I think 200 people were actually supporting the work, just the co-creation work alone. It was a fun experience, but uh, I'd like to, I would like to leave some time for the movie. So I'm gonna skip through these different venues. Science Symposia was fantastic. It was more about the scientific. So what was nice about all these events, it was not just like, let's have activity and let's do whatever to co-create. It actually focused on the problem. So we, we are, Practical. We like to apply creativity to solve <laughs> versus reporting problems. We want to focus on, uh, on discovering problems, collecting insight, engaging everybody, and bringing everybody together and really around what's really important and how we can continue to grow together. So these had a team. So, for example, uh, energy, smart energy. How can we uh, how can we build communities and, and systems that will uh, allow us to to kind of be more choiceful about the energy solutions that we have. Food, food is a big problem. Nine million billion people by 2050, how are we gonna feed ourselves, right? Uh, and uh, mobility and urbanization, you've seen what jo Jonathan mentioned uh, yesterday. Uh, so all together, uh, I'd skip through this just to bring it back to more like a mindfulness. We had the traveling tour and so on. But in, okay, I'm this is one that I want to mention, uh, community program near and dear to my heart, connected to care program. Employees would actually bring their problems that they observe in the communities. And we had 150 projects would get $5,000 for people to go and volunteer and do something good in their community, what they wanted to do. So that was all grassroots kind of from engaging the whole organization to make selection, who they want to, uh, uh, what, what are the problems they want to solve and how they want to engage and so on. Uh, I'll, we'll talk about this in a break if you would like the sound of VSF. So bringing the sound, so mindfulness, again, paying attention, what is around us, collecting sounds across the, you know, you, in your environment, in your workplace, and creating one piece of music that was our song, that, that was an art project that, that uh, we did. And the book is here also, it's called 150 Moments. So again, moments and mindfulness. I'll pass it around if you'd like to see. So it captures pictures from this whole global experience. And uh, I really want to show this movie because this pretty much puts it all together. Um, can, can we play now? If we keep going at the rate we're going, the world may possibly not be a great place for us to live in the future. For me, I'm a mother and I have a child. I worry about the next generation. If you ask me as a father, the quality of life and the resources. There will be a lot of fights and wars over small little things which is available on the earth. Die Welt, wie sie mal war, glaube ich, wird es nicht mehr so geben. Really, we create a lot of problems in a short period of time. In 2050, 9 billion people will be on the earth. Es ist aber kein Platz, um sich in der Stadt zu bewegen. The trees that we cut, the air that we pollute, 
The energy sources we have now, they're hurting our environment. Wir leben in einer Wegwerfgesellschaft hier im Westen auf jeden Fall. Wir hauen einfach alles weg, ja? Some people have everything and some really have nothing. There are people who are hungry. Why? Why? The lakes don't get filled up. We don't get water regularly. There will come a time when my children won't have water. But how do we how do we get out of that or get in it to fix it? Companies are more focused on to their growth, but they're not really seeing what is a long-term solution, what is necessary for really for human beings. You know, progress, progress. We need to build more. We need to have, you know, taller buildings. We're not going to last if we continue on this premise that we can grow without limits. The Earth or the world, they are barren. But the barrens always have a limit. I feel like people need to be more aware. Man muss halt einfach mal aufwachen. It is so easy today to be informed. The question is, are humans smart enough to get us out of this mess? I don't think you can fix it all with just scientists in the room. The problems are much more complicated. They require pretty much everybody to get on board and involved. You need to step back and then look in a bigger map. Yeah? Complete a holistic picture. Let's connect with people and show them what we know. Sich gegenseitig anregen, dann kann was kann was sehr sehr Gutes und Großes entstehen. We can combine the ideas, insights, opinions, perspectives, so that the culture of innovation percolates through the society a bit more. Und dass dadurch mehr zusammenkommt. There will be a network of, of folks coming together, different coalitions, informally almost, to solve this problem. We have to co-create, we have to be synergized in the way we think as well as the way we act. Have a change in society so that everyone takes responsibility. Large corporations, universities, you know, scientific um, community especially. It's about creativity, and thinking about where you want to be creative and, and how do you want to help out. And there are people who are speaking up and looking for solutions. If there's enough folks that want it, we get to a tipping point and we see that new paradigm happen. the time is up looks like we just finished in time <laughs> I, I just want to kind of mention one thing that this movie is a, is a documentary movie so we had a filming crew that went and and followed whatever journey our employees had in all these different parts of the world this is totally not script this is uns not unscripted so this is what uh, people feel and think some of them are employees some of them are external partners but what is nice that there was this emerging common theme of the raising level of consciousness about care, about connectedness, about the networks, and about creativity. And it's very humbling experience to, um, and it's unexpected gift to be able to, ex to kind of go through this and to feel it. And I think what really happens, we think sometimes we're gonna make a change, we're gonna drive and lead change, but in fact, sometimes that change changes us, and it's really a great thing when that happens. So that's my story about creative space. So, questions? Or oh, we have time for questions? Yeah. No, I think we have time for uh, just one or two questions, if anybody has any. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I've been working in sustainability for 20 years, and I very much see the concept of mindfulness as like the big missing piece of that. Talking about internal well-being, and then you know what that mirroring that on the outside. My question is, you know, because you've talked about innovation and growth, and you have elements of sustainability. Um, are you addressing mindfulness specifically within these, or are you talking about well-being? How are you kind of connecting the dots between these okay. concepts? So the question about connect, so maybe I'll first go how I connect mindfulness with, with innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we can go back to these neural networks. To, so to, and there is actually a study at, uh, I think, Drexel University researchers show that uh, it's really I mean, the, the capacity, I, I'd like to differentiate between creativity and productivity. We often see here 
Today it's all about performance and resilience and so on. To me, that's more like surviving. That's a lower place where we can live, maybe a lower, lower potential versus like a higher potential. Can we live from the space of love and creativity? And I think that's the unique skill. So where I think about mindfulness and why I'm uh, interested in it is really how can we live in that space of creativity and love? So creativity and innovate, I mean to innovate, we really need something, like we need to have a creativity, ability to create, right? right. And to imagine. And to, uh, and the love of course comes to, can we make it holistic? So that's my personal kind of philosophy. Uh, now how that connects to sustainability, I'd say, again, I'll give you my personal philosophy is that it, it through mindfulness, we increase maybe awareness of who we are and identity. Am I just the person who I'm standing today here in front of you? Or am I uh, a, am a member of a certain family? Or maybe member of this community? And the more, me, or I mean at least the more I practice mindfulness and so on, the more I see similarities and connections and the more I see a part of bigger thing, right? And that's when I can think that way and feel that way, I can actually when I go back to my daily job in creating solutions, I can think of a more holistic solutions versus, oh, let me tackle the task at hand. Mm -hmm. So that would be, it's not direct answer, but I'm trying to kind of, it really comes to individuals making more holistic choices. Yeah, I'm just curious, are you using that type of language in discussions internally? Uh, okay. Uh, I think we're still learning. We are not there, uh, I think, but I've seen the more and more practitioners around company that kind of coming out of <laughs> closets and using the language of mindfulness. This campaign itself, like it, we, we were not intentional, we were somewhat intentional, but creator space was like, I think that came from the creator, it was not, not really intentionally because of mindfulness, but it really connected everything together. So the language becomes to be, uh, to be Right. And the language of mindfulness, or the words of mindfulness, becoming part of our language nowadays. We still have a way to go. Mm -hmm. Other questions? I think, uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for, but okay. thank you so much. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you.